So today it's going to be all about Elon Musk with a little bit at the end about Twitter. So that's what the video is about. I hope you like the video. If you like the video, please do like the video. And if you haven't subscribed, please do subscribe and tell somebody else maybe to take a look at my channel. Maybe they'll subscribe. And thank you very much for watching. Hi, I'm Mark. This is my journey through tarot. Come on. So yeah, this was a viewer request. Uh, Zenbazine is the name of the viewer. And um, it says, read about Elon Musk and the future of Twitter. So I did a little bit of research about Elon. Uh, it's a little lengthy, but it's interesting. Very interesting, as a matter of fact. So we'll do that, and then we'll do the cards. Elon Musk and Twitter. Okay, so in 1971, Elon Reeve Musk was born on June 28th, so he's a cancer from Pretoria, South Africa, and his mother, Mae Musk, is a model and dietitian from Saskatchewan, Canada, uh, raised in South Africa. His father, Errol Musk, is a South African electrical electromechanical engineer, pilot, sailor, consultant, property develop developer, and half-owner of a Zambian emerald mine. Elon has a younger brother and sister, and Elon's estimated net worth is $210 billion. He's the richest man in the world. Now, the Musk family was wealthy during his youth. Uh, he attended a preparatory school, an all-boys high school. His father was elected to the Pretori Pretoria City Council for the Anti-Apartheid Progressive Party, and his maternal grandfather was an adventurer, adventurous American-born Canadian, American-born Canadian, who took his family on record-breaking journeys to Africa and Australia in a single-engine airplane. Think about that, his grandfather at that time. Now, in 1980, his parents divorced, and Elon lived with his father, regretting it, they became estranged. A biography of Elon describes an awkward, introverted child. Remember that. In 1981, when he was 10, he was interested in computing and video games, teaching himself to program from a computer user manual. <laughs> okay. And then in 1983, at 12, he sold a computer game to an office, office technology magazine for about $500. Then in 1986, at 17, Elon moved to Canada for citizenship through his mother, and that would make it easier to eventually immigrate to the United States. And while waiting for the application to be processed, he attended the University of Pretoria for five months, and that uh, helped him avoid uh, mandatory military service in South Africa. Now, in 1989, he arrived in Canada in June and lived with a second cousin in Saskatchewan for a year, working odd jobs at a farm and a lumber mill. And in 1990, he entered Queen's University in Kingston, uh, Ontario. In 1992, he transferred to the University of Pennsylvania in the USA, uh, earning uh, bachelor's degrees multiple in physics and science. And then in 1994, he held two Silicon Valley internships, one at an energy storage startup and the other at a rocket science games company. And then 19, in 1995, he moved to California to attend Stanford University for a PhD program, but in, uh, and that was in material science, but instead he pursued a business career with a degree in economics from the Wharton School. So, and then he co-founded a web software company called Zip2 with his brother. Their dad provided 28000 in funding. Zip2 developed an internet city guide with maps, directions, yellow pages for newspapers. And they had a small rented office space in Palo Alto, uh, Silicon Valley, and then Musk coded the website nightly. Eventually, Zip2 got contracts with the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune. So that's pretty impressive. Then in 1999, the startup was acquired by Compaq for $307 million in cash. And in February, that was in February, and Musk received $22 million for his 7% share. Later, Musk co-founded XCOM, an online financial services situation and email payment company. And XCOM was one of the first federally insured online banks. You know how the bank always says uh, federally insured up to, what is it, $200,000? So this is one of the first federally insured online banks with over 200 thousand customers that joined in the first months of the operation and uh, the investors however regarded him as inexperienced and replaced him with Intuit CEO Bill Harris by the end of the year. Now 2000 XCOM merged with the online bank Confinity to avoid competition and Confinity's money transfer service which was called PayPal was more popular than XCOM's money transfer service. Then Musk became CEO of the merged 
company and Confinity's founder resigned and the board ousted and replaced Elon and uh, focused on the money transfer service and renamed the whole thing as PayPal in 2001. Now then also Musk discussed uh, funding a growth chamber for plants on Mars. Uh, he traveled to Moscow for refurbished intercontinental ballistic missiles. He needed those to send the greenhouse payloads into space, but because he was seen as an, a novice, he returned empty-handed. But then in 2002, Russia offered one rocket for $8 million, and Musk decided uh, to build his own affordable rockets with $100 million of his own money, and he founded SpaceX as CEO and chief engineer. And uh, eBay bought PayPal for $1.5 billion, and, and then Musk made, with 11.72% of the shares, he received $175.8 million dollars for that. Now 2003, uh, now Tesla Incorporated, that was originally Tesla Motors, was incorporated by Martin Eberhard and Mark Tarpening. And in 2004, Musk invested 6.5 million and then as the majority shareholder became chairman of the board of directors and product architect. And in 2006, he helped create a solar energy company that later became Tesla Energy. And Martin Eberhard was ousted from the firm. Now 2015, Musk co-founded OpenAI, Artificial Intelligence, and promoting friendly artificial intelligence and co-founded a neurotechnology company focused on developing, developing brain-computer interfaces and with $100 million founded The Boring Company for tunnel construction. Then 2016, Neuralink, the first company, uh, aims to in integrate the human brain with artificial intelligence, AI, uh, with devices embedded in the brain to merge the machines. Uh, we would have enhanced memory and communicate with software, plus it would treat Alzheimer's, dementia, spinal cord injuries. 2017 now, Musk purchased the XCOM domain from PayPal for its sentimental value. You know, X, like XCOM.com, X.com.com, whatever it is. So he purchased that domain for sentimental value from PayPal. 2019, he won a defamation suit by a British caver who had advised the Tom Long cave rescue. Now, you remember the boys that were trapped in the cave? And um, and uh, Musk had tweeted out the, the pedo, talking about one of the cave divers, uh, calling him a pedophile. Well, that's this. But Musk won. And Musk was the longest tenured CEO of any automotive manufacturer globally. He announced work on a device like a sewing machine to embed threads into the human brain. And 2020, Musk described one of the early devices as a Fitbit for your skull that would soon cure paralysis, deafness, blindness, and other disabilities. And neuroscientists uh, criticized the claims, and MIT Technology Review described them as highly speculative and theater. And Musk has shown a pig with a Neuralink implant that tracked activity related to smell. In 2001, Musk nominally changed his title to Techno King as CEO. And in 2022, as we all know, he purchased Twitter for $44 billion, is the president of Musk Foundation, donating to scientific research and education, has contentious perspectives on politics, various technologies. He also has been criticized for unscientific statements, spreading COVID-19 misinformation. But Neuralink announced that clinical trials would begin by the end of 2022. So after all that, let's see how Musk and Twitter is going to do. Here we go. We're going to talk about Elon Musk and then Twitter. So the Toth deck just seems like they, these were the perfect cards. They're a little bit of a hard edge. They don't read exactly like the Rider weight cards, so I may struggle a bit, but I just have to trust that spirit or wherever I get this information from, if it's somewhere deep in my brain even, uh, understands that. And uh, I have to trust the, um, the interpretations that come through. What else can I do? So Elon Musk and Twitter. So the thing is, is that he is a technical genius, apparently, and he's a risk taker. And now because he's so rich, he can afford to take risks. But I mean, even though you're, the, well, I don't know. I was going to say, you like, you know, you can be rich by uh, owning a house. And so now your, uh, your value uh, uh, or your wealth is considered the value of that house, but you may not have much cash on hand, okay? Or you may have a finite amount of cash on hand, so it doesn't feel like you're that rich. So with Elon Musk, he's he's got millions of dollars available to him to spend, but making these billion-dollar deals, $44 billion to buy Twitter, you know, requires some sort of management of all of your wealth and your debt. And so there's no doubt that he's he's genius. 
but I think he is socially enough, and I think he's getting some of the information from his uh, reactions to political and personal uh, uh, things about people uh, is from some areas of the web, but most of us probably don't look at. So let's see what the cards tell us about Musk and then Twitter. And uh, so, but first, you know, let's have a moment of meditation. Elon Musk. Let's get uh, warmed up with just three cards. I just want to know, is he a decent person? Is he on the side of good or is he on the side of evil? I don't want to know, does he think he's on the side of good or evil? I want to know karmically, cards, what can you tell me? Is he actually on the side of good or evil? Okay, three cards. Let's see what this says. One, two, Three. And I wonder if that sometimes shifts in your lifetime. But I mean, he's he's pretty settled into who he is now. He's a, a solidly middle-aged man. So good or evil from from karma. That's Let, from from the collective. Let's find out what's going on. Well, he's a fighter. He's uh, this is the Knight of Wands. This is the fighter of the of the Royal Suite and the Royal Suite of Wands. See on fire or action uh, plans, uh, making things happen, and he is that person. That's for sure. Whether he's good or bad, he's that person. Next card is um, it's 14. And this, uh, okay, it, this is like a temperance card. Uh, this is finding that perfect balance of the materials that you're putting together. And in this uh, in this card, this these major arcanas, I don't know if you can see it very faintly here, behind the word art, it says trumps. So these are the Trump card, and this one is described as art. And again, blend, making that perfect blend, getting things just exactly right. Uh, it's like a temperance card, but uh, these cards aren't quite the same sort of description as Rider Waite. So, so th this is who he has been. Okay. And then the final card is whether he's good or evil is failure. Isn't that interesting? And so this card here are discs. It tells you behind here. So these are pentacles. This is value. Oh, th this is wands back here in the faint, faintly written behind knight of wands. And so this is discs. These are pentacles. These are value. And this is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of pentacles. And the seven of pentacles typically is wondering if you've done enough. But more specifically, in this deck, it's failure. And if you remember in, in a lot of what was in his history, there was quite a bit of failure there. It's just that he doesn't stop. And when he made successes, there were enormous successes. So failure is almost his, his, his fail safe. You know, I heard once that, uh, for instance, if you're selling something, uh, uh, you want a lot of people to tell you no because you got to get through all those no's before you find that, that one yes or those few yeses to whatever it is you're selling. So the no's have to be welcome. You have to regard those those rejections as like an actor would say, yeah, give me all these rejections. Let me finally get to the one big break. So is he good or evil? I don't think he is evil, but I don't think he's overtly good. The cards tell us that he's a fighter for his actions, that he's always trying to find that perfect blend, and that um, in the future, uh, with this failure, it's not something that he's afraid of. I think he's a risk taker, is what he is. I think that's what he is. Well, let's ask one more question, just to be, uh, one more three-card question. Is he just socially inept? Is he just socially inept? Elon Musk personally, from the collective, from the universe, is he just socially inept? Is that the deal with him? Okay. One, two, three. Is he just socially inept? I think that's it. Let's see. First card? Okay. Ah, it's something he always has to work on. This is a three of uh, discs. And this is work, as it says right here, works. So always having to work uh, at that social aspect. I think he's deficient there. The next card then is the Knight of Cups. Okay, 
the fighter for that emotion. He really has to put effort into, and look how beautiful these cards are, by the way. Look at the steed and this, this person riding that steed with these beautiful uh, angelic wings, holding that cup with a little surprise inside. So the Knight of Cups, he, this is, is the emotion of a thing is something that he has, uh, has had to work with. And then the final card, is he socially inept? Yeah. Looking at things from another perspective. Yeah. His view of what's going on is skewed. Okay. It's upside down and it's hard to make out what the real, um, emotional value or what the uh, compassionate, uh, truth or untruth, uh, might be. So yeah, he is socially uh, inept as a matter of fact. So now let's just do six cards on um, first Elon Musk and then uh, some cards on Twitter. So Elon Musk, is he, what do we want to know about Elon Musk? Okay, he's the richest man in the world. That's amazing. Um, he seems to be uh, in, inserting himself into po world politics. And uh, does he have an eye towards some sort of mass world domination. Six cards. Yeah, let's ask. One, two, three, four, five. I think he thinks he knows better than all of us, or certainly than the majority of people that he runs into. I think he has that kind of feeling uh, like Trump. So the first card, the signifier card, um, world domination, is that what he's after? So look at this. This is the Princess of Wands, another beautiful card. You can see this tiger is, before you get into really the definition, you can see this tiger right here, this, this princess, this female figure holding that staff, you know, with a brilliant star on the end of it, has, and her antenna is just stretching out, her hair as antenna stretching out. Uh, the Princess of Wands. So this is the Wands. And Wands are actions, plans, forward movement. And so this Princess of Wands has the tiger by the tail. Now, a princess is not as, uh, as, as forceful as maybe would be a knight. So she's somewhere below the knight. But this Princess of Wands, um, there's a little bit of it there. He's got a fair amount. He has a royal amount of that sort of ambition. Uh, this, that would be any, uh, a plan an action. That's the signifier. The challenge to that is the Wheel of Fortune. Well, of course it is, because for him, if it's solely um, mechanical or computer or uh, thought-driven, then he's got the edge. But this emotional situation, ruler of the world or some sort of mass domination, that would be a Wheel of Fortune for him because of his missteps, his emotional missteps, the missteps that he's prone to. And then the uh, base of this whole thing with this nine of wands, which is uh, strength. But uh, the nine of wands is typically, you know, a pretty embattled card. So it's a, it's a lot of, the, the bottom of this thing is that he's got what it takes to go the distance. And then the past of it is this four of cups, which is uh, luxury. And the Four of Cups is typically being offered something that you don't particularly want. But in this case, I would say it's recognizing that that Four of Cups are, are a luxury. They're not a necessity. They're an emotional plus. Um, and uh, maybe the emotional part of it isn't uh, so important to him, only worth Four Cups. The sky of this then, ah, okay. So we ask world domination and we get in the sky, the devil card. So chained to lesser intentions. So if he is, he has a strong, strong uh, bent towards uh, this being chained towards lesser intentions that are not noble intentions always. Okay, so that's interesting. And then the final card for, uh, is he interested in that, is the star. Yep. He is. The star is a big yes card. Another another beautiful card. This shows uh, uh, the the world behind her in this amazing universe. Uh, this female energy has one hand ex extended here with a cup, just drenching herself and all of that emotion coming out of that cup. And then with the other hand, just very carelessly, very nonchalantly, thoughtlessly, just dumping out those emotions out the other side. So this is a star really basking in all of her glory and not caring much 
uh, about uh, the emotional effect of it. Yeah, it's there. He wouldn't mind. So now Twitter. What is going to happen with Twitter? So I want to know, I don't want to ask if Trump's going to be allowed back on, okay? Because I don't know. I think he probably will. But I want to, according to Musk's uh, little uh, feelers that he sent out, but I want to know for Twitter, is it going to continue in the short term to be a uh, force in the political political events in the United States? Because that's what it has been. Um, and in the short term, I mean, you know, in the next 10 years, well, let's say five years even. So in the next five years, and cards are not typically good with time, but I can say in the next five years, let's get five stacks. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so Twitter. Is it going to be at least for the next five years, such a major influence on our politics. One, two, four, five, and six. Twitter, our politics. Okay, here we go. The signifier card. Uh, okay, so Queen of Swords. This is truth, justice, rules, and law. That's what swords are. This queen has chopped off the head of somebody here. The queen is very strong in her suit. And she doesn't seem to be wielding this sword in a comfortable way. But the queen is still a yes card. So that's the signifier. The challenge to that very strong, forceful, wielding truth, justice, rules, and law in not quite the right way, okay? The challenge to that, ah, disappointment. So this is the Five of Cups. Uh, so the Five of Cups is, yeah, just exactly that. Um, feeling that uh, you've left something behind, disappointment. And it's all about emotion. So this disappointment is the challenge to Twitter as a twisted uh, uh, influence on our politics. The base of this then, with this Knight of Swords, again, remember that that Knight is a fighter for his royal cause, which is swords, truth, justice, rules, and law. And this Knight is, is, is a winged Knight. You can see his wings right here and this beautiful horse that he's on. And he's really like racing into the, the battle here. So Twitter is like this Knight, okay? Um, really racing into this situation. The past of this, with this Ten of Cups, it's, uh, and you can see here, um, say, 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 being very satiated. I don't know how to pronounce this word. Uh, but the Cups is emotional, and this is having all of that that you, that you want. You're full up. You've got it all that, all that you need, and, and you're very satisfied with that. But that's in the past, uh, in Twitter's past. In the sky, uh, for Twitter, whether there'll be a major influence in the next five years over our politics, look at this, is the lover's card. And of course it is. So yeah, they will still be intertwined uh, with the politics, okay? Uh, all the sides are represented here. And if you look deep into this card, you see uh, two little uh, male children here. Uh, a wa there's black and there's white. You see the, um, like the eagle and the, the gargoyle kind of animals here. You see one carrying a club and one carrying uh, flowers. And you see a serpent right here at the base of everything. And then as this goes up, you see the feminine energy now starts to come into play. We save a female darker figure and a female uh, uh, lighter figure with their hands uh, grasped. Okay, this is the lovers. And then as this uh, becomes even more and more, it grows into a power that if you look right here, you can see that these are arms sticking out. This is like a robe right here. This is beginning to be a whole other entity 
right here, a hooded kind of a figure with an angel, Cupid angel flying over. And you've got uh, the uh, male and the female uh, energy right up here at the top of the of the spirit. And so this lover's card is so very important. And it's so very important that it's at the top of this because look at all that it represents to become this figure that's controlling everything, the arms outstretched. So yeah, it's all encompassing. It's encompassing generations, Twitter. It's a perfect card to describe Twitter. And then the final outcome for whether the Twitter will continue to be, and this looks like, yes, a major force in politics into the future is, yeah, it's worry, okay? This is the five of pentacles, the five of discs, and it represents worry, you know? And this is a very busy, a very cumbersome, a very mechanical mechanism that you're concerned whether it's gonna work out right. And so yeah, it will continue to be a worry. So we're asking the question, will Twitter uh, be a major influence in politics? And it starts out as a great big queen of swords, but kind of not holding uh, truth and justice the way you would and having chopped off someone's head uh, in their power. But then the, uh, the uh, challenge to that is disappointment, emotional disappointment. And then the base of the whole thing is Twitter fighting for that, what they think is their truth or justice, okay? And then the past of it, with this being so satiated emotionally, you know, it was a very satisfying situation to be Twitter and to and to listen to Twitter. And the sky of this is really overall domination, trying to find that right balance. But the uh, likely outcome is that it's just a lot of worry and it's going to be troublesome. And so Twitter is going to continue to be a thorn in people's side. But now let's go specifically to the next presidential ele election and ask uh, in just a few cards, three cards, I guess, if Twitter will be a major determinant in the outcome of the next election period. Will Twitter be a major determinant in the outcome of the next election? Will Twitter be a major determinant in the outcome of the next election? Because it certainly was in the last elections. Three cards. One, two, three. Will Twitter be a determinant in the outcome? And, you know, an influence in the outcome of the next election. And uh, three cards. First one is wealth. They've got the power. Next card, looking at things from another perspective. And the next card, peace, it says here. So this is the Two of Swords, finding a balance. It looks like, okay, so will it be a, a determinant in the next election? Yeah, they've got the power, okay? They've got this skewed kind of a view on what's happening, but in the end, it looks like making that choice determined as peace. Uh, will rule. So they may be, and it may not be so bad that they uh, that they are. You never know how the cards are coming to come out. I say it every single time. But this guy, Elon, I mean, he's a genius, and it looks like socially he's missing a piece somehow. And the things that he comments on, which kind of show you what he's, what kind of websites uh, having to do with human uh, interaction uh, he's watching on some of those dark uh, site, uh, webs, I suppose. Uh, it gives you a clue as to the person. He's a genius, but socially, he's a little askew. Hey, I'm going to show you the cards now. Hang on. Okay, so these are the Toth tarot deck. Alice, Alistair Crowley. And these are from U.S. Game Systems. And uh, these cards are pretty amazing. Um, some like to use them if they've got kind of a severe uh, subject uh, that they think needs, uh, um, you know, a very direct uh, answer to them, in, in, uh, not a, a flowery answer. The guidebook is very useful, as a matter of fact. It's easy to read, and it's got some interesting uh, uh, information here on the um, author of the card and the painter of the cards and uh, with some uh, collaboration. So I'll just read this one little thing. This is by Lady Frida Harris, who actually painted these cards. And she says, Arthur Crowley's Toth tarot deck, the tarot could be described as God's picture book, or it could be likened to a celestial game of chess, the trumps being the pieces to be moved according to the law of their own order over a checkered board of the four elements. I love that. That's a very insightful way. If you think of the artist using that as her guiding light to designing the cards, that's that's pretty awesome. Uh, the cards themselves are 
are easy to read if you read the cards. In other words, if you don't impose your uh, predetermined notion of what a particular uh, card is supposed to mean, uh, like I often do, because I'm very much like the Rider Waite system, but these Toth cards are amazing. What happens here is that um, they tell you here in a, I don't know if you can see it, but in the background you see this tells you this is Wands, and of course this is the Prince of Wands, and then the um, the Major Arcana, they show them in the very faintly, you see here it says Trumps, and uh, then this tells you this is Art. So they're not exactly the same uh, order of divination as the Rider Waite system, but not far off. And if you take a minute to familiarize yourself with, the, with how they um, are ordered, then I think you'll be okay. And I'd just like to give you this chance to look at all these cards spread out in case you don't get a chance to see uh, a lot of tarot cards. Um, maybe you're thinking about buying some cards and this would help you make a decision for or against these. They're a little big, so they're awkward to use, but once you get used to them, then that's fine. Just like anything, once you get used to using them, um, you know, you acclimate yourself to the system. So this is the Aleister Crowley Toth deck. Love these cards, actually. I'm Mark, my journey through tarot. Tomorrow's another day. Stop by, we'll do it again. Ciao for now. You really make a big difference. Thank you.